Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, webinar series by International Training Center for Operational Oceanography. Uh, you all know, uh, going to this pandemic, still we are continuing with online courses. But once in a while, we just wanted to have uh, very short presentations through webinars by famous scientists in their respective fields. So uh, in, in line with this, today I'm very happy to introduce uh, Dr. Proxy Matthew Cole, uh, who is working at IITM. I think uh, it doesn't require an introduction, but it's it's a mandatory thing that we we need to do for all those who are giving uh, the webinars as a part of ECHO. So I'll give a brief uh, introduction about uh, Roxy. Uh, we all know Roxy is a climate scientist, and he is currently working at Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, Pune, in India. He did his PhD in ocean and atmospheric dynamics from Hokkaido University, Japan. And, and I think most of us already know that he had made many breakthrough contributions to observing and predicting the Indo-Pacific climate, facilitating the food, water and economy security of the region. So that's a wonderful contribution, both from science as well as from the humanitarian uh, grounds. And then uh, uh, owing to his nature of work, we know he, he definitely be, be Part of so many panels and all. So he is chair of the Indian Ocean Region panel and also the lead author of IPCC report. And he actively collaborates with uh, citizens, science network, local governments, and media. And very important thing is he wants to bring the science to the society. That's one important aspect all the scientists have to follow. And then, uh, very, uh, I mean, very happy to uh, tell to all that like, he is among. Uh, the list of top two scientists ranked by the Stanford University, and he was awarded that Kavli Fellowship in 2015 and the NRC Senior Research Fellowship in 2018 by U.S. National Academy of Sciences. And the Indian Metrospheric Society felicitated him with Young Scientist Award in 2016 for his research on changes in the monsoon. Uh, I think I can go on like this, uh, trying to introduce uh, him, but like I request Dr. Roxy to deliver his lecture on the topic climate change in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, Roxy, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Uday Baskar, and thank you very much to IPCO Ocean for conducting these training programs. Uh, we think it's quite important to have these training programs very often so that you know we have a, a reliable observing system and capacity to observe the rapidly changing ocean around us, the Indian Ocean. We'll see how and uh, why the Indian Ocean is changing, uh, what are their impact, what are the impacts of these changes and all. So I'm Roxy Matikol, as uh, Dr. Uday Baskar mentioned, I work in the Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology in Pune in India. So a very warm good morning to all of you who are listening to this. I will share a few slides that I have prepared so that we can elaborate on the climate change aspects in the Indian Ocean, the extreme weather events, both over the ocean atmosphere and over, over the land. Yeah. Since I, I live in India, uh, some, of, some of these uh, changes that I show might be uh, more focused on South Asia, but I will see to give, I will try to give a overall perspective on how it is changing for the for the entire Indian Ocean Rim uh, region or the Indo-Pacific region. Yeah. So this uh, what we have here is a very old or ancient map of the Indian Ocean or, or, or the globe of, with a focus on the Indian Ocean, right? We can. Uh, sorry. Let me use my highlighter. Yeah. So we have the Indian Ocean region over here. Yeah. And this is this ocean, this tropical ocean is particularly different from all the other oceans. You can see, uh, especially the 
tropical Atlantic. Uh, if you look at the west, you can see the Atlantic. Is not land landlocked like the Indian Ocean. Uh, it has openings to the north and south, right? And similarly for the Pacific Ocean also. Yeah. Both opens to the north and south. So whatever warmth, whatever additional energy it uh, receives along the equatorial region or the tropical region, it can flush out to the uh, to the poles quite easily. But you see that the Indian Ocean is landlocked to the north. Yeah, so it's quite different. I mean, it's a small ocean. It's the warmest ocean of all the tropical oceans, and it's also warming quite rapidly. Yeah, and uh, but there is one small opening or a few states of opening here. We call it the Indonesian through flow. So this is a single only the only opening in the tropics between any ocean basins yeah so if there is any uh, oceanic transfer in the tropics it is through the uh, indonesian through flow otherwise uh, so and it's called the uh, oceanic tunnel as well otherwise over the atmospheric uh, over the atmosphere we have a lot of uh, teleconnections through the walker circulation and other other modes of circulation right so this ocean is changing quite rapidly. In fact, the entire globe is changing rapidly. And this is a figure from the recent IPCC report. It shows the global surface temperature increase since the 1850s uh, until the recent period. That is in the black line that you see here. So we have reached at about 1.1 degrees Celsius. That is the global mean temperature change since 1850 due to anthropogenic carbon emissions or carbon dioxide emissions in large. Yeah? And what do the projections show? This is what the projections show what different scenarios. We call them the shared socioeconomic pathways or uh, different emission pathways. Yeah? And SSP5 is the high end road. That is, uh, uh, if, we, if we keep the emissions uh, as business as usual, as we see now, and what IPCC tells us of now is that because the nationally determined contribution, so this is the emissions each country across the globe has agreed to uh, in terms of reduction of emissions and all under the Paris Agreement. So even if all the nations stick to these nationally determined contributions, yeah, they are not sufficient to keep the temperatures down. And the global temperatures, which is now 1.1 degrees Celsius, will cross 1.5 degrees Celsius. Yeah, we have the 1.5 degrees Celsius here by between 2020 and 2040. Yeah, if you see that it's being crossed between any, you take any scenario, it will cross 1.5 degrees Celsius between 2040, uh, between 2020 and 2040. Yeah, and between 2040 and 2060, it will cross two degrees Celsius. So that is like almost double of what we have experienced until now. And we can't even imagine, even as a scientist, I cannot imagine the impacts of a two degrees Celsius. Yeah. Even at one degree Celsius, currently we have heat waves across Europe. We had heat waves in South Asia, across in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, uh, during March, April, May, and it, that was not even a uh, one day or a one week heat wave. It was not a one month heat wave. It was a season long heat wave, March, April, May, and creeping into June. Right? And where does all this heat go? Where does the heat from global warming go? We need to look beneath the surface. So the temperature change that we saw earlier in the previous slide, yeah. I, I put a snapshot of that slide. This is the global surface temperature change, what we see on the surface, but more heat is being absorbed by the Earth system, right? And if you separate the Earth system components and we uh, look into where the heat has been absorbed during the last uh, uh, several decades since 1960s, we see that 
more than 93% of the additional heat is absorbed by the ocean. Yeah. <coughs> so uh, if, if you look at the uh, energy imbalance or the total amount of uh, energy absorbed by the earth system component uh, due to anthropogenic uh, or carbon emissions, you see that more than there is, a, you, you can see on the y axis the energy uh, budget in zeta joules. Zeta joules means 10 raised to the power of 21, 10 raised to 21 joules. So for more than 400 zeta joules of energy has been absorbed by the by the air system. Out of which 93 percent is being is is absorbed by the ocean. Earlier the earlier the uh, share was thought to be 90 percent. Now accurate measurements show that it's more than 93 percent. Yeah. So the land atmosphere and ice altogether absorbs less than 7% of the heat. So mostly what we see in the surface, that surface one degree Celsius warming and, and all is from that, uh, usually from that the others 7%, uh, whatever we see on the surface. And oceans we know is a huge reservoir of heat, we will see that, yeah. And there is, uh, there, are, there are several studies, uh, you know, uh, equating this to seven Hiroshima atomic bombs equivalent energy each second, 24 hours a day for 365 days a year. So that's just to imagine. So uh, there's a study from uh, Richie Telly et al. Uh, in the recent times where they have compared this uh, uh, energy absorbed by ocean to the Hiroshima atomic bomb. Now, a lot of this heat goes to the uh, near surface ocean, zero to 300 meters, you can see, and then the um, below that, and even deep ocean is absorbing a lot of this heat. And this, the heat absorbed by the oceans are also uneven. Some regions are absorbing more heat than other oceans. Yeah. Why is the ocean absorbing more heat? First of all, we know that the ocean covers more than 70% of the Earth's surface. Yeah. And also it is the average depth of the ocean is about four kilometers. Four kilometers of water yeah, across 70% of the Earth's surface. So that's a lot of ocean absorbing the heat. And it's not just that. The heat capacity of water or the ocean is higher than the land or the atmosphere. It's as simple as that. Yeah. So ocean can or the water can absorb more heat and keep it for a longer time. That's because of their specific heat capacity property. That's also because of a chemical property of water called the polarity. Yeah. How the atomic bonds work out in, in the water, the water molecule. Yeah. So there is just a comparison, a cube comparison. We don't have to go into all the numbers and all, but if you look at the heat capacity, the in a uh, approximate way we can say it's around 4,000 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. While for land or the rock, it's about 800. So we might think, okay, there is not much difference. I mean, it's only uh, the water, the heat capacity is only five times. But we know that the water, the uh, the solar energy or the radiation that we receive can uh, penetrate further deep up to 100 meter depth. Yeah. So if you take a 100 meter depth of water and if you calculate the uh, per square meter energy absorbed, yeah, it would be around four, 4 into 10 raised to 9 joules for the ocean. But for the land, uh, if we, if we calculate, if we suppose that the energy is absorbed for uh, one meter depth, yeah, the equivalent energy absorbed by land is about four four point eight into ten raised to seven joules. So the look at the change in the uh, power here, yeah. So uh, uh, ideally or approximately, oceans absorb hundred times more than land. 
Yeah. So that is one reason why uh, more than 93% of the heat is absorbed by the ocean. Okay. Based on this property and the fact that the oceans cover a lot of surface area and they are deep with average depth of four kilometers. And it's not the heat, it's not just the heat that the oceans absorb. They are also absorbing a lot of the carbon dioxide we emit. So see, the oceans have been helping us for quite a long time. Otherwise, the impacts would have been much more larger if all this carbon dioxide and all this heat was absorbed by the atmosphere, right? And studies, uh, I have shown the references below. If you want, you can refer those and other accompanying references as well. So this is a figure from Sabine et al. So uh, what this and other studies or research shows is that the ocean is absorbing carbon dioxide also. And how much? Maybe more than 50% of the anthropogenic carbon dioxide emitted in the last 200 years have been absorbed by the ocean. And where does it absorb? The largest absorption is over the North Atlantic region. So all these colors show where, uh, which regions are the largest sinks and all, and the yellow red colors show where the absorption is the largest. And you can see the entire ocean, most of the regions to some extent absorbs carbon dioxide, anthropogenic carbon dioxide. So this the inventory for the anthropogenic carbon dioxide, where it goes, yeah. And why Atlantic Ocean? So that's that's the region uh, that uh, I, I told earlier, earlier, the Atlantic is open to the north and south, so it reaches up to the poles. And when the ocean circulation, the currents reach to the poles, yeah, because it is so cold, ice formation happens, right? When ice formation happens, it re releases a salt in the water. Ice falls, uh, forms without the brine or the salt. And the water and the whatever is rejected, yeah, dissolves with the water there. So the water there is cold and saltier than the water elsewhere. And as a result, it sinks. Yeah. So there is a lot of sinking in North Atlantic. So this sinking in the North Atlantic is a major driver for the Atlantic meridional ocean circulation or the global ocean circulation, which goes across the ocean. Yeah. At different levels and at different depths. So this is a, one of the major reasons why a uh, lot of anthropogenic carbon dioxide is being absorbed by the oceans. What happens when this carbon dioxide is absorbed by the ocean? When carbon dioxide is absorbed by the ocean, it becomes carbonic acid. Yeah. So uh, it mixes with the uh, hydrogen. Uh, it mixes with the S2 or the water and becomes carbonic acid. But carbonic acid is a weak acid. So it's not like the acid in our stomach and all, which can digest, uh, you know, food and all. Yeah, it's a weak acid. But also because it's a weak acid, it, it disassociates quite fast. Yeah, so it tends, it separates to carbonate. Uh, it, 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 sorry, it, it, separa it separates and... Uh, disassociates, uh, bringing in more hydrogen ions. It, uh, you, you can see the hydrogen ions here, yeah? And as a result, the pH of the water changes, it becomes more acidic, yeah? So you know what happens when the ocean acidifies? It doesn't support the marine ecosystem. And also, because of these changes in the, uh, in the carbonate system, uh, and disassociation, the marine organisms, which depends on the exoskeleton. Exoskeleton is the shell that they have. Like uh, we know, we know, like uh, the mollusks and other organisms with shells, and even corals. Yeah. So for those formation, for coral formation or shell formation, we need more carbonate. But because of this uh, mixing of excessive carbon intake. Uh, they are unable to grow and form large shells and hard parts or uh, big corals. Yeah, so this affects the entire marine ecosystem. So you see, uh, the ocean is absorbing a lot of uh, heat, and ocean is absorbing a lot of carbon dioxide also. So it changes the condition. So, but it is a slow process. 
So the ocean absorption uh, is of carbon dioxide is a slow process, and that's what we see here. Yeah. So suppose we stop all the carbon dioxide emissions right now. Yeah. We call it 100%. Yeah. And we stop it right now. Whatever we had until now is 100%. And the land and atmosphere will up keep absorbing whatever we emitted until right now. Yeah. But it will still take up to 100 years. On the y, on the x axis, you have years. It will take up to 100 years to remove 60% of the carbon dioxide. We will still have 40% of the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Yeah. So it is a very, uh, even the land absorption than atmosphere absorption is a slow process. It will take hundreds of years to remove that 60% of the carbon dioxide. But then the ocean also keeps absorbing, but it's a slow process. It will take more than 1,000 years to remove about 80% of that carbon dioxide. Still, we will have 20 to 30% of that carbon dioxide. Yeah. So even after a millennium, even if we stop all carbon emissions, yeah, 15 to 40 percent of the carbon dioxide will still remain, which means that the carbon dioxide emissions are the, the, the lifespan is quite long. So whatever emissions we had will still remain in place. And the impacts that we see also will remain impacts in terms of extreme weather events. And all. The oceans are playing a la la large role. You see that. Yeah. I mentioned that uh, the oceans are also warming non uniformly. Some oceans are warming much more than the other oceans. And this is a, a snippet from the most recent IPCC. Uh, Sixth assessment report, yeah, IPCC AR6. So what does it say? Since the 1950s, since the 1950s, the fastest surface warming has occurred in the ocean. And this is actually from, uh, uh, based on our study from IATM on, on the Indian Ocean warming. Yeah. And, and other studies from uh, our colleagues from INCOIS and from other institutions across India. We have shown that, uh, uh, in fact, in terms of surface warming, yeah, Indian Ocean is among the fastest in the tropical, the tropical basins. And you can see that we were talking about the global surface temperature warming, right? Since 1850, 1850 to now, the global surface temperature warming is around 1, 1.1 degrees Celsius. But if you look at the sea surface temperature change in the Indian Ocean alone, since just 1950s, yeah, you can see temperatures going up to 1.1, 1.2 degrees Celsius. Yeah, you can see here. And it's a basin wide warming. So this warming in the Indian Ocean beats the global surface temperature warming or the warming in anywhere. And it's basin wide warming having a huge impact. But the point I am making here is that even this warming of 1.2 degrees Celsius in the past several decades is dwarfed by the warming that we are expecting in the future. So here on the right, we have the warming that we had until right, right now. That change looks so small compared to uh, the projected changes in the future. And these are at different scenarios. The most probable is the blue or the red. And uh, as of now, it seems we are taking the high road, the, uh, the red, and if you are taking that, the projected change is about 3.8 degrees Celsius per century. And this is not somewhere in the far future. Future we are living through. Most, most of us will see through 2050 by when the temperature change will be around 2 degrees Celsius or more. And uh, by, by end of the century, uh, temperature change of 3.8 degrees Celsius or more, which is quite huge. So that means the ocean is at our doorstep. 
particularly when we speak about Indian Ocean. And we already see many of these impacts. We see in terms of changes in our uh, hydrology, particularly the monsoonal changes across the Indian Ocean Rim. We see in terms of floods and droughts, our water cycle has changed. If you look at Africa, we see changes in droughts, famines, even locust swarms have been linked to warming of the Indian Ocean. Over South Asia, we have monsoon floods and droughts. East Asia, monsoon floods again. Australia, droughts and wildfires. In fact, we see wildfires over South Asia and other regions as well. And then we have changes in cyclones and storm surges. In fact, over here also, I, uh, uh, here I have only uh, shown for the North India, but we see in the Western Indian Ocean also there are more and more storms. I will get into that in, the, in a later slide. Significant increase in the number of cyclones and storm surges associated with it. And we have heat waves. Heat waves have been happening over Northwest India and Pakistan. And many of these heat waves have been linked to oceanic changes over the Indian Ocean and the Pacific as well. And like terrestrial heat waves, we have heat waves over the uh, ocean as well. Marine heat waves happening both over the over the ocean leading to coral bleaching, over the North Indian Ocean and also the Western Indian Ocean and Central Indian Ocean as well. And changes in marine phytoplankton, the microscopic plants in the ocean, which support uh, support the entire food chain or the food web of the ocean. And an overarching impact is the sea level rise. We will see why the sea level is rising, and it is rising across the Indian Ocean. Uh, in fact, sinking some islands in the East Indian Ocean, North Indian Ocean as well. We will see the visible impacts some of the slides here. So basically the climate change and uh, in particularly the Indian Ocean warming is already directly affecting the food, water, energy and economic security of Africa, Asia and Australia, all the Indian Ocean rim nations. I will get into directly into the, the impacts uh, on the African region uh, in terms of storms and uh, local swamps. In fact, it reached uh, even India as well. Yeah. So uh, I have put several pictures here. We will explain it one by one. So during 2018, 2019 and 2020, there were a lot of locust swamps in East Africa. Yeah. So this was actually triggered by multiple storms in the Western Indian Ocean region. Yeah. So what, what is the reason behind it? So how we look at this set of figures that I show, uh, where I show the oceanic changes, the changes in the Indian Ocean. So in a climatological sense, this is how the normal ocean temperatures should be. Yeah. So there is a warm pool in the Indian Ocean. Uh, this is actually the, the, the figure for the North and summer. Uh, generally, we have uh, warm pool with 28 uh, temperatures above 27, 28 degrees Celsius, which can support active convection and also cyclones and storms as well. But if you look at the Western Indian Ocean region, uh, it is generally cool temperatures below 27, 26 degrees Celsius, which do not support active convection. This is how the temperatures have been historically. Now that has changed. Yeah. So generally between west and east, there is a strong gradient. So this is a time series from 1900 until recent period. Yeah. So if you look, there is up to one degree Celsius difference between the east and west. But the west, western Indian Ocean has warmed rapidly during this century, and the temperatures have closed that gap between the west and the east. And it has reached temperatures. So these, uh, uh, remember that these are the average temperatures. Temperatures have reached almost 28 degrees Celsius in the Western Indian Ocean. So that means that 
oceanic conditions here are now primed to support more and more storms. So this is what happened in 2018, 2019, yeah. So the temperatures there were much warmer. It supported a lot of convection, a lot of storms were there, storms and cyclones were there. As a result, Africa received a lot of rains. It triggered a lot of locust swamps, which then got carried by the moist winds towards the Arabian Peninsula and towards the Indian or the Asian subcontinent. Yeah. In fact, in even in over central India, uh, there were instances of central and south India, there were instances of uh, locusts, which is why I have put this interesting picture on the left bottom. Yeah. So this is a bee eater from India consuming a locust, which is not part of its usual diet. Yeah. So you can see some changes in far away in the Western Indian Ocean is making dietary changes to avifauna or the birds over the Indian subcontinent. So these are far reaching changes happening across the Indian Ocean Rim countries. And it affects, so these locust swamps affected agriculture across Africa and not only Africa, but over India as well. And in fact, this is a picture from uh, India of uh, the locust swamps over some agriculture crops. So we see that it is affecting the changes in the ocean, how far reaching or cascading impacts. Similarly, the changes are seen in the marine diversity, uh, in, in the marine phytoplankton as well. So on the left, we have uh, the changes in chlorophyll. Yeah. And uh, we know that the Western Indian Ocean region is a very dynamic region because the monsoon winds act there. So because of upwelling, both coastal and open ocean upwelling, there is a lot of nutrients coming up, which supports the phytoplankton production, primary production of the, of, of the oceans. Yeah. So it's a very biologically productive region. But if you look at the changes in the chlorophyll, chlorophyll rep represents approximately represent the phytoplankton production. There is a decrease. The purple colors shows the decrease in phytoplankton during the last several decades. You can see that across this region, there is a decrease in phytoplankton. Correspondingly, you see, uh, you know, there was a SST increase also. The patterns match very well uh, over the Arabian Sea region. So what happens? So what happens is that when the surface is warming much more than the subsurface, especially rapid warming at the surface, yeah, it, uh, the surface water becomes less dense. Yeah. So increase in temperature, the surface water becomes less dense than the subsurface. So it prevents the mixing of the subsurface nutrient rich water with the surface. So the phytoplankton, the sub phytoplankton in the surface do not have, or the near surface do not have sufficient nutrients to support production. So as a result, the phytoplankton, so there is, uh, if, uh, you know, in ideal conditions, there is a lot of nutrient flux. In stratified ocean, there is less nutrient flux. So the phytoplankton becomes smaller compared to smaller or lesser compared to the earlier. Yeah. So this result in uh, reduction in the phytoplankton that we see here. And this could cascade into the, uh, the, the uh, food web as well, because uh, zooplankton depends on phytoplankton, the fishes depend on zooplankton, but this links are still to be explored closely. We do not have enough data. We do not have the best models to study this. Yeah. But we do see that the fisheries are declining. Now, this is a picture of how the tuna population has declined in the past several decades. From 1950s. Now, this is largely due to industrial, sorry, largely due to industrial fisher, fisheries and not due to climate change. But what we are saying is that the, the ocean warming 
and the decrease in phytoplankton production is found to be an added stressor in the fisheries decline. Yeah. And many models, particularly from the CMFRA, Central Marine Fisheries Research Institute, and other studies also show a 20 to 60 percent decline in sardine catches. Also, I myself am a, a sardine lover, but I see that sardines are declining already and they are going to further decline into the future. Yeah, so we see these cascading impacts and uh, these impacts are not just on the biosphere, but it, uh, it in fact, in fact, impacts the largest atmospheric phenomenon in the tropics or the strongest phenomenon uh, in the tropics. That's the monsoon system, yeah, seasonal phenomenon. The monsoon winds yeah, or the monsoon circulation. So ideally, we say that uh, to some extent, the monsoon is driven by the temperature contrast between the land, the subcontinent, and the, the Tibetan plateau uh, and the ocean. Yeah, it's not just the surface temperatures, but also the tropospheric temperatures and their difference that drives the monsoon. So generally during north and summer, the Tibetan plateau, Indo-Tibetan plateau, uh, it gets much warmer and the accompanying troposphere also gets warmer. Yeah, the Indian Ocean is relatively cool. So this drives the monsoon winds or the monsoon circulation. And globally, the surface have been warming faster over the land than over the ocean. So this is from NOAA, it shows generally in the northern hemisphere or wherever the land is, the warming is much more in the land than over the ocean. But if you look at the Indian Ocean region that we are focusing on in this talk, yeah, the ocean has been warming much more than the land. Yeah. So as a result, there is a decline in the monsoon. Uh, we may not see this decline if we look at the all India rainfall, but even in the all India rainfall, we see a slump in the recent period. So this is more than 150 years of the monsoon rainfall. Since the advent of IMT, uh, there has been daily records of uh, rainfall. And uh, each bar here shows the annual deviation, annual rainfall anomaly from the mean. And uh, Red shows when it is less than 10% and blue shows when it's more than 10%. So those are typically drought or wet years. But and the and the gray shows the normal years. Yeah. And the dot shows the El Nino and La Nina years because they have a huge impact on the monsoon as well. <clears throat> so generally we see when it's a La Nina, it's a wet monsoon. And when it's uh, early, you know, it's a drought monsoon. Yeah. And this scenario has a bit changed in the recent period, especially since the 1990s or since 2000s. Yeah. If you see the recent period, there is no wet year, significantly wet year, about 10 percent in the last 20 plus years. But there have been many drought years. There were many below normal years here. And uh, these droughts are significant droughts also. And some of them have occurred even without without a uh, El uh, you know. yeah. And the slump that we see, so monsoon shows a decadal, multi-decadal variability, but the slump here is much more larger compared to the other. And we see that if you take regions over the Indian subcontinent, this decrease in monsoon rainfall is much more stronger. Now, I'm not getting into all details of it, yeah. but basically this is the mechanism. So in a normal monsoon, the warm and the troposphere above is much more warmer than the ocean. Ocean is also warm, but relatively cooler. Yeah. So that drives the monsoon circulation that we see here. This is the monsoon western. Yeah. But now, Due to anthropogenic warming, the ocean, Indian Ocean has warmed much more. 
so it has kind of weakened the monsoon and so there are more rains more rains are happening but the <clears throat> amount of rain is mostly happening over the ocean <coughs> now it is not just uh, <coughs> a weakening pardon uh, let me drink a sip of water Thank you for the waiting. So it is not just a change. Uh, it's not just the changes in the total amount of rainfall. There are changes in the extreme rainfall events also. So this is a picture of uh, uh, the distribution of extreme rainfall events across the Indian, India. So all those yellow red colors that we see here, uh, uh, yeah. So those are regions where the extreme rainfall events have increased tremendously. So what is happening is that when the total amount of rainfall is decreasing, that gray line is the total amount of rainfall. This is actually for a region over central India. Uh, we call it the monsoon or so. Yeah. When the total amount of rainfall is decreasing, the extreme rainfall events are increasing. So what does that mean? It means that we are having long dry periods, intermittent with short spells of heavy rainfall. So floods and droughts, basically. The propensity towards more floods and droughts have increased. And this is a property of global warming also. You might have heard about the cautious clapeyron relationship, where when the air is more warmer, it can hold more moisture for a longer time. So for every degree Celsius of increase in atmospheric temperature, it can hold up to seven to 10 percentage of more moisture. And uh, consequently more rains also, but we see that this is happening more for the extreme rainfall events. It is not increasing the total amount of rainfall. Now coming on to the ocean, there are much more changes over the ocean also. One of the major change uh, is in heat waves over the ocean. We are seeing heat waves over the ocean as well. Heat waves, uh, uh, marine heat waves, we call them marine heat waves. And this is a term that was coined just a decade ago. Before that, we never, we had never heard about, about marine heat waves, though it was happening. Yeah. So what are marine heat waves? Marine heat waves are periods of extremely high temperatures in the ocean generally defined as about the 90th percentile and uh, it's not like a wave i have uh, i have got many questions from the public uh, is it like a wave traveling across the ocean it's not like a wave it's these are like patches of warm water uh, on in the ocean and they are not just in the surface they creep into the subsurface as well these marine heat waves they cause habitat destruction coral bleaching, seagrass destruction. Uh, so loss of kelp forest, it affects the fisheries, corals and all. Yeah, uh, this is an example that I've given here uh, and this from May. So uh, if you look at left bottom, that is how the sea surface temperatures should be in average conditions uh, where the temperatures should be between 27, 28 to 30 degrees Celsius or maximum 31 degrees Celsius, yeah? But we see that during marine heat waves, this from May 2020 or 2021, yeah, May 2020, it's from the same corresponding period, yeah? We see that uh, the temperatures are reaching up to 32, 33 degrees Celsius across North Indian Ocean. And even if you look at this diagram, yeah, we see that this is from a major heat wave, marine heat wave during April, May 2020. This is how the average temperature should be. The blue color shows the average temperature. The green shows the 90th percentile. And we see that during the almost for a month, all this red color is showing, yeah, is a marine heat wave. The, that black line is the observed temperature. Yeah. We see that for more than a month, this heat wave persisted. The temperature is reaching up to 31, 32 degrees Celsius. 
up to. So the, the, you can see the change is about two to three degrees Celsius from average temperature. So this has a huge impact on corals. Here your picture is from Netflix, a documentary called Chasing Coral. Uh, corals are generally beautiful. You see this pink uh, color over there. And it is a mucous membrane called Susandli that is providing this beautiful color. It also provides the shield or protects the corals. Yeah? But warm temperatures bleaches it away. That's why it looks dull. Yeah? And more and when more and more marine heat risk happens, more and more bleaching happens, and the corals get killed. So the same, so the, so these marine heat waves that I show here, yeah, resulted in bleaching of corals in the Gulf of Mangar. That is one region where we have a lot of corals. And not only that, it also resulted in uh, intensification of cyclones as well. So I have plotted cyclone alpha and here when cyclone happened. It happened around uh, in May, just when the marine heat waves were at this peak. So generally we see that extreme high sea surface temperatures are preceding Indian cyclones, favoring their rapid intensification. Recently, many studies have come up. Yeah, and also after this cyclone, we see a huge drop, temperature dropping up to, there is a drop of up to four degrees Celsius. Yeah, four degrees Celsius. And still it's maintaining that high temperatures about 30 degrees Celsius. So you drop and then going back to bouncing back to more than average temperatures. Now, how are we limited in understanding this marine heat risk? We saw the, the figure that we saw earlier is a figure from based on satellite estimates of sea surface temperature. Now, if you look at in situ or on site measurements of using buoys and all, we have more buoys from GOES and NAOT. So this, this is a measure from measurement from one of the buoys during, just before this uh, amp, cyclone alpha during this morning. Okay. Now the temperatures you see uh, are reaching up to this high resolution measurement. So we'll see peak temperatures reaching up to 34, 33 degrees Celsius. And these are temperatures which we have never seen anywhere in the tropical open ocean. Yeah, 32 to 34 degrees Celsius. Now, how do we know that this is not an instrument error only by only having more and more buoys like this? But we do not have observations. Even this buoy, uh, I, I'm unable to, uh, you know, uh, if, you, if you look at the, it's, it's the BD-13, uh, I'm unable to, uh, see the recent measurements. Yeah. And this is due to multiple reasons. Due to the pandemic, there has uh, there has been servicing of many of the buoys. Uh, there are moorings in the ocean called Rama moorings from the US. Many of them uh, have been lost during the last two, three years due to lack of servicing and maintenance. So we are unable to closely observe this kind of marine heat risk. And this is important because this data goes into cyclone forecasting system, monsoon forecasting system, climate change projections. So if you do not understand the oceanic changes at <clears throat> high resolution and for longer periods, we won't be able to forecast and project uh, the changes over the ocean. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, that is that's one important point. So we see that these uh, marine heat waves are resulting in intensification of cyclones and all. And one uh, impact that we see is that not only the cyclone character, cyclone frequency, intensity, and all are changing, but cyclones are intensifying rapidly also. Uh, like recently, the cyclone Amphanin has fell from cat category one to category five cyclone in just over the night. Yeah. So you. See, Sleep thinking that it's a weak to moderate cyclone, but when you wake up, the cyclone has already taken off the roof of your house. Yeah, and this is a big challenge for forecasters because uh, we 
because the oceanic conditions is not well integrated to uh, into this uh, cyclone forecast subsurface conditions marine heat wave conditions are not well integrated so forecasts are unable to pick up this rapid intensification yeah and uh, we see a large changes over the arabian sea region or the western indian ocean region like i said because the ocean warming is much more higher there yeah so there is a 52 percent increase in the arabian sea cyclones compared to the earlier periods and it's not just the number of cyclones but also the duration of cyclones have increased putting a lot of pressure on the uh, on the arabian sea rim countries and it's not just the you know the the destruction power of cyclones in terms of wind the winds churn out a lot of waves the waves can be as high as 5 to 10 meters high yeah so we call them storm surges when they approach the land and push a lot of water so it leads to coastal flooding and all so uh, one of these cyclones in the Bay of Bengal resulted in waves as high as 10 meters. Now, this is the forecast, wave height forecast from ECOIS. Now, if you want this forecast to work accurately, we need more in situ observations. In the Another impact is of ocean warming is sea level changes, particularly over the Indian Ocean region, Africa, Asia, East Asian regions because there are a lot of low-lying lands and small islands which are vulnerable so the coastal area is huge and the population is also huge within this circle we have one half of the global population and a lot of them reside in the coastal areas so the impact on the coastal region is huge and even if you look at the indian ocean region the change in sea level is non-uniform some regions, the sea level rise is much more, particularly over the North Bay Bengal region, the rate of sea level rise is much more than the Arabian Sea region here. One reason is that the ocean warming is not just due to melting glaciers. There is something called the thermal expansion. So water expands in volume as it warms. So this is much more, more than 50% of the sea level expansion or sea level rise in the Indian Ocean, more than 50% is due to thermal expansion of water because the Indian Ocean is warming quite fast. So it's projected that up to 1.1 meter of, of uh, you know, sea level rise by 2100 if emissions are not reduced. We already see the impacts of that. Uh, so one of the islands in the fringes of the East Indian Ocean called Bramble K uh, had got wiped out and one of the endemic species called Bramble K. melami was the first species to be extinct due to anthropogenic climate change. And we see already in the Bay of Bengal, some of the island, uh, you can Google and see one island, this from several decades back, now it is sinking. Now there are multiple efforts to restore, uh, like seagrass restoration, coral restoration and all. I'm not getting into much adaptation measures here. This is uh, because the talk is uh, talk will go extended and extended i'll try to finish the talk in five five minutes less than five minutes right now i think it's okay so there have been multiple attempts in multiple ways to bring this island back so one way is by seagrass meadow restoration around the island and also coral restoration so that the singing is not rapid uh, and also it doesn't get inundated by frequent storm surges and uh, sea level rise as well. And they show that the biodiversity there. So uh, because of the singing of the island and also a lot of human interventions, uh, coral mining and all, that region had lost a lot of biodiversity. There was no fish abundant there. But once the seagrass was restored and corals were restored, they showed that this, uh, the fish the fish abundance have increased over that region largely. So there are ways in which you know we can work out uh, in terms of marine ecosystem and all, yeah, and in terms of forecasts as well for early warning system. Now, I would like to say what happens in Indian Ocean do not stay in the Indian Ocean. It has far-reaching impacts. So I'm not getting into details of these mechanisms and all. 
but Indian Ocean warming. So water warming here has a strong correlation with changes in the US. The rainfall in the US is controlled by changes in the Indian Ocean. So what happens is the warming here impacts the upper atmospheric wave trains. You can see these wave trains traveling and impacting the US coast, uh, rains in the US coast. Yeah. And it affects the large, the, 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 the most important climate, uh, climate uh, phenomena, the, uh, the meridional overturning circulation in the ocean. So climate change has been supposed to weaken the Atlantic circulation, but we see that the Indian Ocean part of it, which is mostly in the surface, have been intensifying. Yeah? And this is uh, um, due to multiple mechanisms on how Indian Ocean affects the Atlantic and then changes the salinity over there. We had talked about the salinity over the, uh, over the Atlantic Ocean, right? Yeah. So that all changes the Atlantic meridian overturning circulation. The study says that even a 0.1 degree Celsius change can result in a 1 degree swirl through. That's the amount of uh, the water transport. One swirl through is about 1 million cubic meter per second. So that must be coming back. And similarly, we see uh, uh, changes in the Indo Pacific region. The warming affects one of the most important. Uh, subseasonal or interseasonal variability in the atmosphere uh, that is the Madden Julian oscillation. So, Madden Julian oscillation generally starts from the Indian Ocean, travels across the Pacific, and sometimes it reaches the Atlantic also, remnants of it, yeah, or get carried to the US as well through the jet stream, to, uh, through the wind jets, yeah. So, we see that with a lot of warming in the Indo Pacific region, the MGO. Cycle is changing, their lifespan is changing. As a result, there is changes in the rainfall over some regions. Some regions are getting wetter, some regions are getting drier during the winter season. So far reaching impacts of the Indian Ocean. So we need to observe it much more closely so that we can understand it, we can forecast it, we can uh, project it for the future as well. So we have come a long way in terms of observing it. If you look at the 19 90s and all the Pacific used to be well uh, monitored, but Indian Ocean had few only monitoring systems. Then we had the Indian Ocean observing system in the recent period, but then this was not fit for I mean, understanding climate change purpose or observing climate change purpose. So we have tried to redesign this Indian Ocean observing systems to understand or you know to address the current challenges. But now pandemic has come up, so we couldn't work out many of these proposed. These are proposed observing system for the coming decade or the current decade. Yeah, but pandemic has hit, which means that we need much more regional partnership. We need countries to work together to improve the uh, observations. This is a wonderful photo that I like. This is a ship from uh, in Kois. Uh, I think it's the Sagar Kanya uh, working with the. Uh, Mooring, the Rama mooring from the US, NOAA. So we see the Ministry of Earth Science institutions and the US institutions working together. We need all the Indian Ocean countries also work together so that we can have more of these joint uh, observing systems in the Indian Ocean. Yeah. So one example is the Rama Omni coordination from, uh, uh, from both the countries. It started. This dialogue started in 2018. In four years, we have the data together in the public domain. I think in the Incois website is still available. But this is for open ocean moorings. We need, uh, we know that the coastal observations are important because coast, coastal dynamics affects the monsoon systems, the phytoplankton, uh, the marine ecosystems, and all. So if we need better forecast in the global domain, we need access to hydrographic scientific data from the exclusive economic zones of these regions as well. So that also means more regional partnerships. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, while Indus picked up these high temperatures, we are still limited in our understanding. Uh, some of these do not work anymore. Uh, and we, we need this kind of observing systems across the regions. Yeah. 
So we all need to network more in terms of institutions in, as people, uh, or, or we need to have this kind of exercises more and more. So that's my talk here, folks. Uh, I thank all my collaborators, my lab mates here, Indian Ocean Network, IPCC team. We have Indian Ocean Observing System Resource Forum. So thanks to all of you. I'm ready to take questions from, from you. I think uh, I took almost one hour, exactly one hour. Uh, and I hope we have time for questions. Yeah. Thank you, Roxy. Uh, that's a wonderful presentation. Uh, even even for people who are not into this particular field, things are very very clear. You made it more uh, generic, so that uh, it can be very easily understood by uh, even the naive in this particular field. Uh, there are, uh, I think, some five six questions which I already copied onto your WhatsApp. Uh, if not, you can also check in the chat box here. Any any of them, you can just use it and answer. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I got around five questions uh, and we can take more if there is time as well. So the first question is uh, uh, about the energy budget that I showed earlier in CETA joules, like 400 CETA joules and more. So the question was how the Earth's energy budget is minimum during 1960. Yeah. So here the energy budget that I showed is based on a reference period. Yeah. And that reference period is from that 1960 period, average from I think around 1950 to 70 or something. Yeah. So what you see is anomaly based on that reference period for that. So whatever before that, before the 1960 or something, you will see the values will be negative. Yeah. And this is same for global temperature anomalies also. Yeah. We take uh, if you take. Uh, uh, reference period as 1850 to 1870s and check the temperature change, we will see you about 1.1 degrees Celsius. But if we go before 1870 or 1850, we will see that temperature anomaly will be like uh, in negative values. So this all totally based on the reference period. Doesn't mean that before that uh, the energy budget is negative. It's a reference, it's the it's absorption from that period. Now, the second question is <clears throat> ways to quantify climate change in a particular oceanic region. What parameter we should consider? Any freely available data for the Bay of Bengal region? So there are multiple ways. Climate change, uh, we saw that it's affecting in, us in multiple ways, multiple sectors. So if you are an oceanographer, <clears throat> uh, it would affect the, uh, the, the primary thing which is most easy to access is the temperature changes. Yeah, it can be in the ocean or it can be in the temperature also. So the most easily available data is sea surface temperature, of course. Uh, there are data sets from, uh, uh, from NOAA, uh, for the NOAA. If you want daily data, optimally interpolated sea surface temperature is there. Then if you want the temperature below, subsurface temperature below. And if you want it for a longer period, there are many oceanic reanalysis data sets as well. Now, if you want temperature at particular regions or particular uh, on-site measurements, we call it in-situ data measurements, we have in COIS uh, data server. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. So, and it's also in open platform. So you can go to the in COIS website and there's a data uh, portal there where you can go through different kind of instruments and the data related to that. Now, it's not just a temperature. The there are changes in salinity, there are changes in the density, there are changes in the oceanic currents. So depending on the complexity of the uh, of the property, the, the data will be difficult to get as well. Yeah, but there are oceanic reanalysis, which is from models where the data is, this data is assimilated. And then, you know, using uh, uh, modeling, they chain out the data for multiple physical properties of the ocean. Then there are biological properties also. You can explore the climatic changes in <clears throat> nutrients like nitrate, phosphate, and all uh, the corresponding changes in phytoplankton using chlorophyll, uh, changes in oceanic currents. 
some satellites measure uh, ocean sal salinity. So there are satellite data for surface temperature, surface parameters, salinity, uh, some ocean currents also, and the winds over the ocean. <clears throat> so many of these, all these have fingerprints of climatic change. Yeah. So it, it depends on what we want to explore and study. Yeah. And Bay of Bengal, you know, there are a lot of uh, changes in sea level also. There are changes in uh, storms and depressions and uh, cyclonic storms also. So a lot of aspects to study. Yeah. And if you if you are interested in the coastal uh, mechanism, there there might be changes in the coastal dynamics. Yeah. How how, the, how are the storms are just changing? And in the Bay of Bengal region, you know the, the the slope is much more different compared to the Arabian Sea coast. So we see that the storm surges are much more larger because of that. So even if you have a similar cyclone in Bay of Bengal with the same intensity as in Arabian Sea, the storm surge will be much more larger in the Bay of Bengal because of uh, the the oceanic shelf, how the the slope of the shelf and all this. So next. Uh, is there any Im Im impacts on ports and harbor structures near the coastal region due to climate change? Definitely, definitely. Not only just ports and harbors, we saw uh, some of the cyclones hitting airports as well. Uh, I think it was Odisha Airport, and I don't know if Kolkata Airport was impacted, but some of the recent cyclones have impacted <coughs> very badly during due to climate change. And one particular impact that I want to uh, I want to mention here is the compound impact. Compound extreme weather event is something where multiple extreme weather events overlap. Yeah. So we see over the Bay of Bengal, uh, even if we do not have a very strong cyclone, for example, Cyclone Yash happened in 2021 yeah, uh, in Bay of Bengal. In Arabian Sea, uh, at the same time, just one week uh, before Cyclone Yas, Cyclone Tote happened. So Cyclone Tote was a cyclone of about 220 km per hour maximum intensity. Extremely severe cyclone. Now, cyclone Yas was a cyclone of about uh, 100, 110 km per hour intensity. So moderate cyclone of half the intensity of Cyclone Tote. But the impact of Cyclone Yas was much more higher in the Bay of Bengal coast. The reason being, it was not just the wind of the cyclone or the storm surge. So cyclone, uh, like I said, this uh, the storm surge from cyclone Yas was much high, up to 10 meters high in some regions. So the amount of water flooding the coastal region was huge. Yeah. So there is a coastal flooding due to storm surges. Along with the same cyclone is now bringing more rains than earlier because there is more available uh, water vapor or moisture in the air. Yeah. So the oceans, uh, uh, from the oceans, there is more evaporation because there is uh, more uh, temperature, the, the heat in the air and the water as well. So more, uh, more evaporation is happening, and the air is holding that moist, moisture for a longer time because warm air holds more moisture for a longer time. Precious clapron relationship, we call it. Yeah. So the cyclones are able to bring in that more moisture resulting in more rains. So there is flooding due to those rains also, 100, 150 millimeter rain. So coastal flooding due to storm surge, on top of that rainfall flooding from the same cyclone. Yeah, it's like a double warming. Now, on top of that, we saw that the Bay of Bengal, the sea level is rising, right? So year by year, decade by decade, the sea level is rising. So your flood level also will rise. So the storm surge flooding and the rainfall flooding is much more higher in the recent period because of the sea level rise. And we know that the Bay of Bengal coast and all, it's also sinking gradually due to subsidence. Yeah, it's a continental level uh, change, yeah, geological change. So multiple factors are overlapping. We call them uh, compound event. And unfortunately, due to uh, during cyclone years, there was a natural event also, high tide. So a lot of water was being pushed into the land. So entire coastal area, I think about up to 60 kilometers in land was the inundation, the flooding. Yeah. 
And you know, it's not like threading due to rains alone. This is a lot of this is seawater. So salt water intrusion is happening along. Sorry, uh, Uday, uh, I think I, I got uh, disconnected for a while. Yeah, you're back again. Please go ahead. Ah, ah, OK, so we see multiple extreme weather events impacting the, 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 the coastal system in this way. Yeah, so it affects, of course, the ports and harbor structures and all the structures. So we need to, if you are building ports and harbors, we need to uh, build it based on the future projection, how the sea level would be in the future, how the cyclones will be in the future, how the <clears throat> flooding will be in the future. Yeah. Uh, in the next 50 years, and we have projections for that. And for that, we should not depend just on past observations, how the past floodings have been. Now to the next question. <coughs> Pardon me. Yes, yes, yes. Now the fourth question is: How does one distinguish anthropogenic carbon dioxide absorption in the ocean from total atmospheric carbon dioxide absorption? Uh, this is a tricky question, and uh, I would say I'm not a <coughs> expert in that. But uh, we have been, at least in some locations, we have been measuring carbon dioxide both over land and in some locations over the ocean and over the islands also. <coughs> and also the flux uh, measurements in over the ocean. Yeah. So using these monitoring methods, there has been a long term understanding or long term monitoring uh, and data uh, assimilation of uh, carbon absorption. So, along with the help of models and the under uh, uh, the uh, the physics and the uh, biochemistry that we understand, we have been able to understand the amount of carbon dioxide, anthropogenic carbon dioxide that has been absorbed. I'm sorry, my throat is very parched. I, I will take uh, more questions. We can approach maybe through email. Uh, you can just Google me and find out. Yeah, I think uh, that's good for today. Thanks. Thanks to all. Um, thank you, Dr. Ro Roxy. I think more or less you have covered all the questions, uh, uh, except the last one that is about dynamics. I think. Uh, uh, that, per that particular person can come back to you uh, by email. There are some questions on like asking about your contacts and all that. So I just uh, said you can just go to IITM website and get full details. And also uh, the Climate Change Center uh, link also has been shared. I think uh, you will start getting more and more uh, emails yeah. now uh, about uh, more information okay. on. Yeah, and then the wonderful talk uh, that you have given. So uh, uh, once again, uh, Thank you for uh, agreeing to deliver this uh, webinar uh, on, on the climate change, which is the buzzword now uh, across. Uh, and then I, I hope to have uh, some more more popular talks uh, in future uh, uh, if, if you agree to go forward with this type of webinars. OK, thank you uh, for uh, this webinar. Thank you once again. Thanks a lot, Udai. Thanks a lot for organizing this. Thanks a lot for all the audience as well. Uh, it was a good session and uh, we see that there is a lot, lot to explore and understand the Indian Ocean. A lot huge scope for researchers and also for policymakers. There's a lot to do. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Bye bye. Have a good